so I am really excited to be sharing about AI and early uh, childhood education. So just a little bit about me. Um, you know me as the LCMS School Ministry Social Online Media Manager person. But before that, I was the Director of Technology and the electives teacher from 2017 to 2022 for Christ Community Lutheran School. So that was working across all four campuses there from their infant program all the way to eighth grade and then helping launch their fifth campus. And then before that, I was actually at Emanuel Lutheran School in St. Charles as their tech coach, computer science teacher, STEM coordinator. And I was working with their two-year-olds all the way up to eighth grade. And uh, I gotta be honest, I think I was probably one of the worst technology coaches in that time frame, from like 2013 to 2017 for early childhood. My big thing was just no technology. Uh, I don't think that should be used for, you know, little three-year-olds, four-year-olds. Um, and, and that's uh, what I was really passionate about. And that was right around when iPads were becoming a big thing and everybody needed to have an iPad in their uh, early childhood center so you could have the little stations for them. And again, I was just kind of the, the person saying, no, I don't think so. They're getting enough screen time as it is. Um, so that, that's kind of where my stance was and still is, uh, especially now after having three kids. So just a little bit about AI. I really think we need to work with a definition to start with because it is the buzzword in education and pretty much everywhere else right now. And that is, and this comes from Tech Target. Artificial intelligence is a simulation of human intelligence processes by mach uh, machines. And I think that's really important to, to hit on. It's not an original thought that it creates. It, it's not something necessarily new. It's just an algorithm of a mashup of everything that's been created in the past. But it acts like it is human intelligence. And at least in its current form, we have to be careful with that because uh, there are some gray areas and some tricky things we can get into. So a little bit about how AI works. So the first thing you'll notice right there is you take raw data. So let's just say we're working with a, a book, right? So you take that book, that's your raw data. Then you pre-process it. Pre-processing is nothing more than just going in. This used to be an actual job for people before AI took over on it. Uh, and that was, you know, finding, you know, what is a noun, verb, adjective, punctuation, uh, sentence structure, things like that. You had to tag all of those. You'd also have to tag the words. So what is the ocean? What are, uh, uh, what's similar to the ocean? What's different from the ocean? So you have all these different tags and then you extract it. You basically put it into a giant Excel spreadsheet. That's the easiest way to describe it. And once you extract it, you can then take your base program and start training it off of that data. And it starts very, very dumb, right? Starts with, you know, A, 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 AAA, AAAB, and then it keeps going on until it starts creating uh, what would appear to be words. Now it's kind of that uh, old idea of, you know, throw a, a hundred monkeys in a room and eventually you'll get Shakespeare. Well, that's really how AI starts in the base form. It needs to be trained and it needs to be trained and tested and validated when it creates good answers. So if you never saw when ChatGPT was technically first released to the public, which I believe was about 2017, it could create a single sentence that was phenomenal. And then if you asked it to create a second sentence to attach on to that sentence, it got a little weird, then it got a little weirder and a little weirder, and it went like crazy, didn't make sense. Well, now we know, right, you can feed ChatGPT and it can essentially spit out an entire book for you. That's how far we've come in such a short amount of time. So once you've gone through that test and validation phase, you start optimizing it. You find ways, shortcuts to make it faster, more usable, has data that makes sense. You deploy it to a larger group of people, and then it helps with decisions and prediction processing that jumps back into that test and validation phase. So if you've ever seen like on ChatGPT, uh, there's a thumbs up button and a thumbs down button, right? So you're actually training the AI model that way. So if you receive a good response, you wanna give it a thumbs up because that's going to pass it on and it's gonna train the model and pass that on to more people. But if you get a response that makes absolutely no sense, then you wanna say it's bad. So it completely forgets it. Make sure it doesn't use anything similar to that. 
So there's different types of AI, and it's important that we understand this as we look at different ways we can use it in education. So the first is what's called a large language model. That's your chat GPT, that's your Llama for meta AI. That's also Gemini, um, <clears throat> which is now embedded into phones, into the new Google phones. Uh, and all it is, is it's just all the information and it's in text. And then it creates more text base off of that. We then get into generative image models. So that'd be things like Mid Journey, Canva has an AI creator, Dolly, um, Dolly's ChatGPT, Bing, Photoshop, and there's a few others out there. And then the one that you might not necessarily realize is conversational AI, which has been around for a long time. That's your Siri, Alexa, Google Assistant, things that we've been interacting with on a daily basis. So Teach AI has this great model when we're looking at where and how it might fit within our organization. And it starts with stage one, which is guidance and policy. Before we do anything, we really should create some sort of guidance, uh, help teachers understand how to use it, and then also a policy. What is the expectation? How should it be utilized? How shouldn't it be utilized? That then flows into your organizational learning because you have that guidance and policy. You can turn it over to your teachers, your staff, and then they can start learning how to use it. And then as they learn how to use it, that goes into improvement and transformation, right? So they're figuring out what's working for them, what's not working for them. Is this a good tool that could be utilized elsewhere, but maybe it doesn't work over here. Now, what I love about this model from Teach AI is how it's uh, kind of almost like a cyclical triangle because your organizational learning is going to feed into your guidance and policy. And your improvement and transformation will also feed into that. And that's something that I think we're kind of bad at, to be honest, as Lutheran educators or as Lutheran administrators. We make our policy once, and then we go like all hands off, and then it comes 10 years later, and we go, oh, I guess we should probably update that, right? So if we can use what's being learned by our staff and then use that to craft more of our policy, to fine tune it, to have it make sense, that's where it really works. So how might this work in an early childhood center? Well, this is something that I will die on, to be honest, is uh, a lot of teachers will use chat GPT. And, and I'm not saying this like I'm making a blanket statement. I've had so many tell me anecdotally and fight with me when I do presentations like this, that they love using it to create emails to be sent to parents in response to something, whether it's a good email or a bad email that they're responding to. Maybe it's praise, maybe it's not, maybe it's a really angry parent. There are a lot of people out there saying, well, let's just use chat, DB, cheap, uh, chat GPT. We'll feed it the angry email. It can summarize it for us and then we'll have it write a response back. And then it's completely lacking that human connection part. And I also find interesting, not necessarily happening in the early childhood centers, but as we see in eighth grade and 12th grade, that there's teachers out there who are actually using chat GPT or a uh, large language model out there to write recommendation letters for their students. And this is what terrifies me because AI should not be a way that disconnects us, right? If somebody writes an email to a parent and they haven't really processed the information, even if it's a negative email, that's eliminating a connection point. And we're called to be in community with each other. And if we use AI as a way to separate community, well, that's bad. And that's where that organizational learning, where we find out teachers doing that, we need to go back and recreate our policy and uh, our guidance on that. But that's just my two cents. That's my little tangent on that one. So how does it work when we look at adoption and practice and really adoption and practice of any technology? Well, it, we can boil it down to these three steps, concern, curiosity, and excitement, right? Anytime something comes out, there's concern. How is this going to be used? Is it gonna be used for good? Is it bad? I don't know how it fits in. Then you find something that makes sense. So you get a little curious on how to use it and you go, wow, it's working like that. Maybe I can use it this way. And then you get really excited. Once you hit that excitement stage, don't necessarily realize this, but then, something triggers and you go, oh no, now I'm a little worried because this can do this. And then we keep going through it. So in this case, I like using the example of my uh, 
wife when she taught English for high schoolers. It was AI came out, huge concern. High schoolers are using it to write full papers. Then she started looking into it. Well, it's a little interesting because it's coming up with these a little deeper ideas that the kids might not have known that she could explore as a teacher herself with her students. Then she got excited. And then all of a sudden she sees it can do this and it brings it back to that concern stage. Whenever we look at adopting any piece of technology, this comes from the TAM model. And I think this is probably the best one. There's TAM2, TAM3, and there's a few other ones. And they get really nitty gritty into the behavior issues with it. But it goes like this. We have our external variable and it flows into the step of perceived ease of use, which will influence our perceived usefulness and our perceived usefulness. Those then develop into an attitude. That attitude creates a behavioral intention and then how we actually apply it. I use Chromebooks in my example for this all the time because I think it, it really works, especially as a coming from the technology side. Really cheap device, the Chromebook, right? That can be utilized. You can deploy it for teachers, students, keep it in the library. Okay, that's cool. How easy is it? Well, you just flip it open, powers on, connects to the internet, starts working. I need it to use to type in my Google Docs. Well, that's pretty useful. So it's created a positive intention to use. That positive intention then goes into my actual system use. It's going to be good. I'm not too worried about it. And then that flows back through it. Now, something like, let's say the iPad, right? I see this with my kids too. And I'll be the first to admit, after having the new baby, it's really tough as a parent on the third child uh, where you're just dead tired. And the, you've been up already for four hours and then the kids wake up at eight and it's like, I, I don't know how to, uh, what to do on this. So um, let's take the iPad, for example, right? So the iPad comes in and I see, well, it's kind of easy to use, but how useful is it? It's not very useful in and of itself. It's not fitting into my classroom. Well, it's gonna create an attitude towards using that, which would be a negative attitude. That negative attitude creates a negative intention to use. We see it a lot with teachers. They put the technology on the desk. They don't use it at all. And then that goes into the system use, not using it. And it flows back. You can do the same thing, uh, use this flow chart with TV. How easy is it to turn on TV? Super easy. Positive. Okay, it's fixing a need for me. Goes this way, system use, and then it keeps that cycle going. Now, the Department of Ed, when uh, created a 70-page white paper, on AI and education. And I'll be the first to admit, I'm not always a big fan of the Department of Education, but they did actually create something useful here. And this is what we should use when we look at any sort of technology policy that we create as well, or adopting new pieces of technology. And it's called their ACE model, the Always Center Educators. So the reason for that is if we're creating any policy, we need to make sure that it always empowers our educators to make the best decisions, right? What works in their classroom? We can't create a blanket statement of all teachers should use AI because it's not going to work in every single teacher's classroom, but it could work in this classroom. So as long as we create policies and adoption models that way, that really center on the educator's ease of use or the educator's uh, use of it, then we don't necessarily have to be concerned about how it's going to be utilized later on because we have that policy that's guiding it on how they should use it and we're empowering them and keeping them first in mind. So what are a few tools that I think could be very useful in early childhood? Well, the first one I think is grantable. Right? How many times do we have our administrators, our directors, uh, they're trying to write a grant, but maybe they don't necessarily have a team. They're trying to get money for maybe a new playground maybe some new, new uh, items for the classroom. Well, Grantable, it's still in beta development, but it's really neat. You feed it your initial grant, uh, what you're writing for your grant. And then it was created by grant writers and it provides AI feedback. So it analyzes everything that's in there. And then it takes what traditionally grant writers and people who grant the grants look at what's successful. And it creates suggestions based off of that. It's a freemium service right now. So you get uh, a base level of free, 
And then if you want some of more of the advanced features, you do have to pay for. That's the only problem with it. The next one is Note GPT. I really like this one. It's a video summarizer. You can take any YouTube video, feed it into here. It's going to create a transcript with timestamps. Going to give you key insights. What are your takeaways from it? And most notable topics that come from it. And it timestamps all of those. So how could this be great as, say, a director or an administrator? Well, very simply, if you have a video training for your teachers, you can feed it uh, into Note GPT and create all of this information. And then you can set them up for success because these are the key insights I want you to take away. Maybe you can't watch the video, so here's a transcript. Maybe look at this highlighted section here. It's also great on the teacher side too. This comes from my middle school experience. I found a great video on uh, recycling. What I didn't necessarily do was watch the entire 40 minute video and some of my students did. So what you can do is take this and it just analyzes it quickly and it gives you that at a glance look at what could be problematic as well. I think that's a very beneficial tool and a lot of different ways to use it. Next is Magic School. This one's developed more for kind of kindergarten and above, but I do think there's some great tools in there for early childhood as well. Magic School is a freemium service, so you do get a base free level. And then if you want some of the more advanced features, you do have to pay for it. But the thing I'd like to highlight in it really is called the text rewriter. So all you do is you feed it a piece of text, whether it's from a book that you've typed in or maybe you found it online, right? Copy, paste that in and say, hey, I need to bring this down to a, a three-year-old level. Or if you have the Lexile range that you need, you can pop in the Lexile range right there. And it will convert that text message, uh, the text into something that's more friendly for those kids. So maybe you're trying to explain a topic or maybe there's a really cool topic that could be used. You could feed it into that and then have it rewrite it so then it's a little easier for them to understand as well. There's some other cool stuff in there. I recommend checking it out. Since it is freemium, all you're doing is giving them your email, log in, and I believe you get two weeks of their premium service for free. So definitely check that one out. And this final one I have here is called Love Heart AI. This is a new one I found while I was uh, looking into making this presentation. And it is also school-focused AI, but it is specifically built or early childhood. So what's interesting about it is when you sign up, it'll actually ask you your philosophy of education. And then once you have that, uh, you get this page. So you can use this for creating summaries for observations, um, raw, uh, jotting down notes, just a lot of different things. So there's still that teacher aspect where the teacher is still taking notes and they're, they're still identifying things for each student. Uh, and here they call it a learning story as well for a journal for each student. But the, the teacher's still taking their time and still working on, you know, what they always do. But they maybe they don't have time to write a full paragraph summary of it, right? They can take it in here, drop their notes in, and then it will write that full summary for them as well. There's some other features in there that I think would be worth exploring. Again, I just found this one, and I, I'll be the first to admit my experience, my forte, isn't necessarily early childhood, but I think this is something that could be very easily utilized. And this is where this is what uh, you would want to kind of follow that teach AI model of give it to the teachers, let them figure out where it works, and then how you can bring it back into them. That is just the quick little presentation on AI and early childhood. My big takeaway for AI is. It, this isn't a tool that should be utilized by students, for sure. This is a tool that should be utilized by teachers to maybe lighten the load, lighten the burden of uh, some of the other day-to-day -day tasks, some of the maybe more menial tasks, or in like Love Hearts example, take some of those observations so then they're not having to craft a full narrative summary for them, uh, instead just working off the observations.